Good morning, third graders. It's Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. We're going to continue to read On the Far Side of the Mountain. Uh, this chapter is titled In Which Bando Finds Some Old Adirondack Furniture, page 91. And for you, Merrick, I'm going to read a little bit louder because you told me the other day that you could barely hear me reading. So I'm going to try and speak up a little bit. <clears throat> At dawn, we return to our campsite pretty much to its original pristine appearance and walk on down the brook. <clears throat> Shortly, we are out of forest and standing in a field. A large farm lies in the valley below. We've lost Alice's trail somewhere, I say. If I were her, I would not go down through a farm with a pig on a leash. I would, Bando says. There's a corn crib down there. Pigs like corn, you know. We look at each other as the same thought strikes us. Alice has already been to the farm. About a hundred yards back, we had noticed several corn cobs along the shore of Fitch's Brook. Still unaccustomed to thinking like a pig, we had agreed that raccoons had been at work on some farmer's crop. Back we go, avalanching rocks as we scramble up the shaley stream bed and arrive at the embankment where we had seen an ear of corn. It's gone. I'm searching upstream for it and any others when Bando calls. He is pointing to the stream bank. Four corn cobs have been laid there in the shape of an arrow. Alice has been here. They point to a big flat rock where a squirrel is now stuffing kernels from another ear of corn in his cheeks. You can't leave anything sitting around in the woods or someone will get it. Even hard deer antlers are eaten by white-footed deer mice. I leap across the stream on the rocks, the squirrel runs, and I pick up his ear of corn. There are broad teeth marks on it which are not squirrel. Could be deer, but it's not. It's pig. Pig droppings near clinch, nearly nearby clinch the identification, and then looking around, I see Crystal's tracks in the soft loam. I'm off. Not so fast, Bindo calls. Come back, I found something else. On bare earth in the sun is another compass. This one is different from the first. Alice has propped up a stick at a 45 degree angle to the ground. It hangs a stone on a string. Under it is a north-south directional stick. Smiling, I recall how Alice and I made a compass like this last spring. We placed a marker on the shadow that the hanging rock cast in the morning. Then, when the sun passed the meridian, we put another marker on the afternoon stone shadow. Between the two marks and directly under the suspended rock, we laid a stick. We had a north-south line. She's checking her direction, I say. Well, she's got north, all right, Bando says, looking at his compass. Her stick points her stick points to within three degrees of true north. And she plotted her directional line, too, I say, pointing to the little pebbles lined up there. Ha, Bando set, lays his compass with the directional arrow lined up with the pebbles. Carefully, he turns the compass housing until the arrow and north are lined up. He looks at the bearing marker. She's going more easterly now, 80 degrees. We spread the county map on the ground and lay a grass blade from our stream location across the page at 80 degrees. The blade crosses the Skahari Reservoir and intercepts Manor Kills Falls. I count contour lines and multiply by 20. Wow, I say, that waterfall drops almost straight down 100 feet. It's Bando's compass. Manor Kill Falls, Bando says. I've read it spectacular. If I were a girl who loved waterfalls, I'd be headed right for it. In fact, I say, I'm so sure she's going there that we should go directly to it without losing any more time following pig tracks. Good idea, Bando agrees. There are no trails or roads up here, so by lining up trees to keep us going in a straight line and by reading the quadrangle maps to avoid cliffs and marshes, we strike off across the top of the mountain range. We traverse fields and forests, walk through barren lands where quails and woodchucks fly up at our feet, and after 12 miles of bushwhacking, enter the Platte Kill State Forest. We are greeted by a flock of wild turkeys, big, big noisy, and glorious. They gobble and fly off, miraculously missing limbs and trunks as they zip through the forest. I could never hit one of those with my sling. Although we're tired, the top of the mountain we're climbing calls to us, and we scramble on to its summit. Here we can see Catskill, Helderberg, and distant Adirondack Mountains. 
I understand why people climb mountains. I'm an eagle. Bando sits down. We've been walking hard si since 6 o'clock a.m., almost 10 hours, and we're both glad to rest. The trek was rough because we stayed in the forests where the understory is a jungle of hazelnut, viburnum, and twisted young hardwoods fighting for the sun. Traveling through them was work. I offer Bando some smoked venison and dried apples. He eats heartily. I'm ready to stop for the night, he says. I don't think we have to hurry now. If I were Alice and had reached Manor Killed Falls, I'd say for at least a day or two, wouldn't you? I sure would, I say, not <clears throat> noting the scratches on his arms and the smudges of dirt on his cheeks. You're right, we don't have to hurry. While he makes his bed, I practice with my sling. On the trek today, I missed 19 out of 20 targets. I'm not doing so well. I guess it takes a lot of practice. Later, Bando sleeps. I watch the stars and think of Frightful. I wake early, pick a few Labrador leaf tea leaves, and brew them in Bando's tin cup. Then I gather a batch of daylily buds for our breakfast. These I moisten in dew and dip in hazelnuts I pounded to a powder with stone. I steam them in spice bush leaves. With a catbird diving at us to chase us away from his nest, we leave the mountaintop on a northeasterly course. <clears throat> Bando is a little stiff and sore this morning, so we walk slowly, enjoying the vistas from the skyline of this mountain range. We stop frequently to consult the map, whether we need to or not. Map reading gives us a good excuse to rest. Sam, look here, Bando says during one of these stops. There's a power line below us. It leads to the road at the bottom of Manor Kill Falls. It'd be a lot easier to walk on the cleared land under those wires than in this dense forest. Shall we take it? I agree we should, and within a few miles, we break out of the tangled undergrowth into a meadow under the power line. We walk in daylilies, Queen Anne's lace, in the last daisies of June. A few black-eyed Susans bloom to say midsummer is nearly here. We make good time, and I practice with my sling on the steel tower struts. There are so many that if I don't hit the one I aim at, I hit the one next to it. This is very satisfying, for although I'm not hitting my target, I'm hitting something. As we follow the meadow down the last steep slope of the mountain range, I see a patch of evening primroses near a stone fence. The root of this flower are very good if you boil them long enough to remove the peppery taste. Taking my hunting knife from its sheath on my belt, I kneel down to dig, to dig, but whoop instead. Bando! Crystal's been here! He runs down the hillside. By golly, she has. We stopped thinking pig, I say. Crystal must have led Alice to the power lines. All kinds of edible plants grow in this habitat. I point to an uprooted primrose, including one of my favorites. Crystal has good taste. Getting to my feet, I glance around. She has also dug up a batch of Jerusalem artichokes, and I pick up one of the potato-like tubers she missed. Thank you, Crystal, I say and stuff it in my pouch along with the primrose. How do you think Crystal found all this food? Bando asked after we had started off again. And I presume she did find it, not Alice. Smell that, I guess, I say. We humans will never know how meadows or mountains smell. But deer and horses and pigs do. Bando sniffs deeply and shakes his head. <clears throat> we were left out when it came to comes to smelling things, he says. I would love to be able to smell a mountain and follow my nose to it. Crystal's tracks are quite obvious now. Uh, Crystal's tracks are quite obvious now that we know that she's been here, and we are able to trot along as we follow her down the steep slope. Bando veers off to the left and stops. Looks like a struggle here, he says, pointing to the tracks that are dug in deep, as if Crystal were resisting and being pulled somewhere. Seems Alice is dragging her into those woods, Bando says. I wonder why, I ask, trying to think like Alice. I look for an answer in the mountains and rolling terrain, but find none. On we go, following the pig tracks. Presently, we enter a dark wood of very old yellow birches and again lose Crystal. The forest ends and we are in a steep hillside looking across a valley at the famous profile of White Man Mountain. Bando, I say, I know what Alice is up to. The summer house of John Burroughs, the nature writer, is somewhere around here. I read parts of his books to Alice last winter. That's the mountain he loved. An artist sketched it for one of his books. We wind down and around and within a quarter of a mile come upon John Burroughs' grave. It is surrounded by a stone wall and covered with lilies of the valley. Bando finds some shelled beech nuts and hazelnuts lying at the base of a hollow tree near the grave. Could this be Alice? He asks, bringing the nuts to me. I'm suspicious of everything now. 
I look at the nuts, all neatly peeled and recognize the handiwork of a white-footed deer mouse. I put my hand in the hollow and find more. Alice has been here, I say, but she did not shell the nuts. She raided a deer mouse pantry. <clears throat> deer mice take the coats off the seeds and nuts before they store them. You're real lucky when you find one. It's like opening a can of cocktail nuts. They're ready to eat. I pop a hazelnut in my mouth. We take to a country road where posters advertising Roxbury Country Fair are nailed to every telephone pole. I love fairs, said Bando. I think we have time to go, do you? No, I answered. I don't think Alice is going to stay at Manor Kill Falls as long as you think she is. There are lots of beautiful cascades in the Hilderbergs. We walk in silence, round a bend, and stop. There it is, I exclaimed, pointing to a small brown house. That's Woodchuck Lodge, John Burroughs' summer home. It is, says Bando. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's the capital of the Adirondack furniture. Look at that house. Bando takes off his pack basket and gets out a notebook and pencil. Woodchuck Lodge is small and rustic with a sharply gabled roof and a porch railing of twisted limbs and branches. The porch furniture looks like my lounging chair and the trim on the gable is a weaving of gnarled oaks and maple branches. Woodchuck Lodge, I read on the door, is a national monument supervised by the National Park Service. At this moment, no one is here but us. I start a small fire in the outdoor fireplace, wrap the primrose and artichoke and maple leaves, and clip some young shoots of pokeweed. You know, Sam, Bando says as he sketches and watches me concoct a wild, savory lunch, I think I'll just open one of the cans of stew. As I put his food on the fire, I see four stones to my left and recognize a Pathfinder sign. Three stones are stacked on one, stacked one on top of the other. The fourth, on the ground beside them, points the direction the person is taking. Bando, I say, squatting behind the sign. Alice has been here. She's changing course, going in the direction of that stone on the ground. How do you know it's Alice? Bando asks. Pig tracks, right here, and an acorn, her woodland signature. Bando lays his compass beside the directional stone and adjusts it. Seventy degrees, he says. She's going east, by northeast again. She's off to Manor Kill Falls, I say, and remove the hot stew from the fire. That's the end of the chapter. <clears throat> we're now on page 101. The next chapter we're going to be reading is titled, In Which I Become Royalty. And um, we're getting pretty close to the end here. Um, 170 pages. So there is a third book in this series, which we will read after we're finished with this, and it's called Frightful's Mountain. Have a great day. Don't forget to check out Google Classroom and the animal and plant observations that will, you can find on YouTube as well. Talk to you soon.